I think the big story that we're really going to follow out of all this, the size of the crowd. You go back to the beginning of the week, the president tweeted out more than a million people had requested to be at this event. The campaign realistically kind of tampered that down to still 100,000 people. No, no small crowd for Tulsa. But today, the street you see behind me, it is full of people right now. But these are all people filing out of the BOK Center. Yeah, Wendy, first up, Mike Jackson, the director of the Legislative Office of Fiscal Transparency. It was the loft report that many lawmakers said open their eyes to some of the problems with these contracts from the city show the arena cost taxpayers about 250 million of that but the interesting thing here is the split between the city and the state the state actually ponied up a bulk of that taxpayer money 203 million with the city footing the bill for the remaining 47 million. Uh, well Wendy Maria I think the thing that really stood out was the administration of that controversial sedative that the state uses midazolam that's the first drug that goes in taking you back to the start of this everything gets started at around four o'clock I was one of 11 total witnesses in there including five media witnesses and even before they raised the curtain John Grant could be heard yelling let's go let's go I want to go back to the last time we talked on December 17th, you told me, quote, in my view, the election is over. In my view, uh, uh, the election's over. And uh, while it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to turn out at the presidential level, I respect the will of the American people. But then on the 6th, you did vote to object to the uh, results from Arizona and Pennsylvania. If you believe the election was over, why then vote to toss out those electoral votes? Pretty damaging hail. I want to show you that right now. Take a look. Here's uh, some good sized pieces of hail and just for scale, got our handy dandy pink golf ball there. Now this hail, as uh, Jordan showed you Colleen Wilson's photo, Colleen with me right now, this hail has melted significantly, but this is some pretty sizable hail that came down here just east of Ada. But we have people on death row that are doing 23andMe DNA tests trying to get their convictions overturned. It's preposterous. That was Governor Stitt last night talking fallout from the McGirt decision with Fox News's Tucker Carlson. His statement drew questions, concerns, and strong reaction from tribal leaders. So tonight we're looking into the governor's statements to see if they're true. Let's start with what he actually said. We have people on death row that are doing 23andMe DNA tests trying to get their convictions overturned. So the first question, can inmates even access DNA tests? We reached out to DOC today, a spokesperson told us, while court-ordered professional DNA tests do happen, there is no circumstance under which an inmate would be allowed to receive or return a DIY DNA test. Now, contraband does make its way into prison, but even in the extremely unlikely scenario, a death row inmate were able to access a DNA kit and send it back out, the results likely wouldn't hold up in court. Take a look at this. This is straight from the 23andMe website. It says while tests can reveal indigenous American history, they are not considered proof of such ancestry in a legal context, meaning this test almost certainly isn't admissible in court. And about getting convictions overturned, Oklahoma courts have ruled the McGirt decision is not retroactive, meaning if you were convicted before the ruling, that conviction stands. The Supreme Court also backed that decision earlier this year. Now, we did reach out to the governor's office for comment. They did note McGirt can still be cited if an inmate's case is still in the appeals process. A spokesman person also sent us this statement seemingly doubling down saying quote convicted murderers are trying to use the McGirt ruling as their get out of jail free card millions moved in a matter of minutes documents obtained by Fox 25 through an open records request show purchase approvals involving the Swadley's foggy bottom kitchen deal were approved by Lieutenant Governor Matt Pinnell within an hour at least a dozen times that includes his first sign off on March 13th 2020 it was for more than $2 million for reimbursements for the restaurant. Documents show Pinnell signed off within 15 minutes of getting the invoice. A year later, on March 5th, documents show Pinnell approved almost $87,000 for increased management fees just four minutes after getting the request. And in July last year, Pinnell approved a $1.5 million payment through email without ever seeing an invoice. But things really speed up in August 2021. That's when the department switched to all electronic approval. On August 4th, documents show Pinnell received a Foggy Bottom Kitchen invoice for more than $4.1 million. According to documents we reviewed, Pinnell viewed the invoice at 5.20 p.m. and signed it less than a minute later. 
In all, documents show Pinnell approved at least $14.7 million in money from the tourism department to Swadley's Foggy Bottom Kitchens. We reached out to the lieutenant governor's office for comment. In a statement we received, a spokesperson says Pinnell does review the invoices he sent. It goes on to say, quote, at the time of the invoice in question, the lieutenant governor had full faith in the agency director and trusted he had properly vetted the information. And regarding the invoice Pinnell approved without seeing it, the statement says that money was, quote, part of that pre-authorized amount to go toward renovating state park restaurants, which the Department of Tourism successfully did. Governor Stitt also confirmed to Fox 25 Pinnell is required to approve everything over a certain amount. All of my cabinet secretaries have to sign off on anything that reports up to them. Uh, so yes, uh, they have to, uh, I think I have an executive order, anything, any expense over $25,000 flows up to our cabinet secretaries. But Pinnell's involvement has caught the eye of lawmakers investigating the contracts. State Representative Ryan Martinez said members want to know more about Pinnell's process. Myself and committee members at, at some point during this process are going to want to talk to the Lieutenant Governor about what his process is in approving uh, any type of invoice, how they review those, and make sure that there's a thorough process that's happening. At first glance, it doesn't seem too thorough to me. Now, on that special committee, Representative Martinez was asked if members would call Lieutenant Governor Pinnell as part of their investigation. He responded, quote, absolutely. Seeing is believing, right? Well, maybe not. Take a look at this. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. That looks and sounds just things. like former President Barack so, Obama. Uh, in reality, instance, it's actor Jordan happen. Peele in a video made by BuzzFeed. This is what's known as a deep fake, a technology time. making it appear anyone is saying anything. Forward, it's a super quick learning algorithm that will pick up on people's speech patterns, the way their voice sounds and things like that, and then can duplicate that with uh, things they haven't actually said before. Do you find yourself becoming part of his orbit? The videos and audio started appearing online about a year ago, and the technology is growing fast, to the point where soon we might not be able to tell what's real from what's not. And the creator of them already said that within another six months to a year, they'll be completely indistinguishable from reality. Dan, this is a great story. Some would even say it's the best in history. Believe me, you are a perfect reporter. Oh, well, thanks, Mr. President. Unfortunately, Donald Trump didn't say any of that. This was put together by our friends over at Stable Voices, and really, it only took them a couple days. Now, they use this technology for fun and parodies, but in the wrong hands, this can be a huge problem, especially with an election only a year away. The 2016 election saw the largest misinformation campaign in U.S. political history, with Russia infiltrating a number of social media sites. But believe me, when they take me on, or when they take any public figure on... Deep fakes could be just the latest weapon in any adversary's arsenal, and there's something tech giants are very aware of. Deep fakes are clearly one of the emerging threats that we need to get in front of and, and, and develop policy around to address. But the impact of this technology is already being felt. There's already been instances of uh, actual people learning the voices of CEOs, bosses, whoever, and calling people to uh, harvest information or fish them in some way. And as deep fake technology grows, the problems grow with it. His name's Richard Beckinsale. They, none of them came here. So Meaning soon, this could impact your daily life. Someone could be calling as your boss and be able to make things up on the fly to accurately respond to what you're saying, which would be incredibly difficult to determine that that's fake if it seems like an organic conversation. Now, Hunter did give us some tips on spotting deep fakes. On the videos, you want to look at the faces. In some cases, the syncing between the mouths and words could be a little off, and facial expressions might just not match up. Lighting is also an issue, and some faces might seem a little blurry. You can also listen carefully. Audio may catch in certain spots, or words might cut off abruptly or be mispronounced. Finally, your best bet is if you see or hear something really outlandish online, Verify it with a trusted source, one you know wouldn't put out falsified information. Bottom line, if we want to be a top 20 city, we have to act like it. If we want to maintain a long-term relationship with the NBA, we have to be proactive. That was Oklahoma City Mayor David Holt earlier this month, catching a lot of people off guard when he hinted at the possibility of a new arena for the Thunder. Now, nothing is finalized, but tonight we are taking a look at what a new arena might cost OKC taxpayers. So here's a look at all the NBA arenas right now. At 20 years old, 
The Paycom Center is actually the 11th youngest, but it did take nine years from approval under the original MAPS program in 1993 for the arena to actually open. So even if the city worked twice as fast, we wouldn't see a new stadium until at least the end of the decade. Another thing, some of the newest arenas are actually in cities about the size of OKC. We're now 20th in population, so let's take a look at some of those for reference. Starting in Sacramento, in 2016, they opened the Golden One Center, home of the Kings. Sacramento, smaller than OKC, 35th in population. It cost them about $535 million when all was said and done to build this arena. And according to numbers from Forbes, the city put up about 250 55 million with the rest coming from team ownership. A year later, 2017, Detroit opened a new home for the Pistons and the Red Wings, the Little Caesars Arena. Detroit also smaller than OKC, 27th in population, but this arena was a lot more expensive, coming in at 863 million. Now, according to numbers from the Detroit News, about 60% of that came from private funding with taxpayers footing the bill for about 324 million. And last one we're looking at tonight, Milwaukee, also smaller than OKC, Milwaukee 31st in population. The Fiserv Forum, the home of the Bucks and Marquette Basketball, opened in 2018 at a cost of 524 million. Numbers from the city show the arena cost taxpayers about 250 million of that. But the interesting thing here is the split between the city and the state. The state actually ponied up a bulk of that taxpayer money, 203 million, with the city footing the bill for the remaining 47 million. So a lot of different funding options if, big if, if Oklahoma City opts for a new arena. And by the way, OKC isn't the only team that's considering a new stadium. The Clippers are set to open the nearly $2 billion Intuit Dome in Inglewood coming up in 2024. And just uh, earlier this month, the 76ers released mock-ups for a new billion dollar stadium with plans to open in the 2030s. Again, nothing set in stone for OKC, but Mayor Holt certainly opened that door. We're going to continue to follow this as it develops. We search for the truth. We seek justice, the courts require it, the victims cry for it, and God demands it. 21 words drawn in red spray paint on the side of a condemned building form one of the most powerful statements from the Oklahoma City bombing. I never thought it'd be up there 25 years later. Never in my wildest dreams. Rocky Yardley is the artist behind maybe the most revered piece of graffiti in the state calling it an homage not only to the victims, but also the men he worked beside for 26 days on Team 5. So, I mean, my heroes were the guys I worked with every day down there. Team 5 was officially formed the morning after the bombing. The group of bomb techs from around the state had the tall task of piecing together evidence from one of the most damaged areas of the bombing. We had the north side of the parking lot, the front of the building. We did the uh, sifting on site of all the, all the uh, evidence that came out of the building. Uh, we, were, we were a pretty busy group. And he gave us all a uh, can of orange spray paint and told us to start finding and painting a large orange circle around each piece of what we can find. The group worked countless hours, refusing to stop until their job was done. Billy Graham and, and President Clinton are gonna be down to fairgrounds for a memorial. We're gonna take a break. And we all looked at each other, We're, we got people in there. You know, we know people that are in there, federal agents that we knew and worked with. We're not gonna take a break. And then the news came. We were down there still looking through cars, still sifting mm -hmm. through the things. And I, there was an a, a FBI agent that came up and said, we got it. At least we are going to get some justice. And then, you know, Rocky comes up with our saying for the side of the Yeah. Field. They were going to tear the, the Journal Record building down. That was the original thought. I had no idea, so I asked if I could spray paint it. And they said, yeah, we're, we're going to do away with the building. And so Rocky painted five sentences as the words just flowed through him. God, I think, spoke to me and said, here you go. All I did was write it. Now, every year, Team 5 returns to the memorial to repaint the historic quote. But Rocky has just one minor regret. I wish I'd have written nicer. <laughs> My penmanship was a little bit just better. Just hours now to Election Day, and President Trump and Joe Biden have wrapped up their final pitches to voters. Here's a look at where we think the electoral map stands right now. Blue states most likely going for Joe Biden. Red for President Trump. That leaves us with about 10 toss-up states right now. Now, for the president, good news. These are all states that he won in 2016, but he's facing two big problems right now. Take a look. 
Not only, first of all, he's trailing Joe Biden in almost all of these states, according to the polling average from 538, loan exception right now, Iowa, and that's a point and a half. But the bigger problem for the president, he's running well behind his 2016 finish numbers. You can see behind three points in Pennsylvania, big losses down here in Wisconsin and Michigan. So how does each one of these candidates win the 2020 election? Let's start with Joe Biden, his path. It's relatively straightforward. He's got to win the two states, two close states that Hillary Clinton won in 2016. That's Nevada and Minnesota already given him to then. Then he's got to win back what's known as the blue wall. That would be Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania. Good news for Biden. He's polling very well in all of those. I took off New Jersey there, but add it back in. That's a 270. He doesn't have to worry about Florida, doesn't have to worry about Texas, Georgia, Arizona. He's got to win those three big states and it goes to him. For the president, the math gets a little bit tougher. Again, taking a look at those polling averages down significantly right now, Wisconsin and Michigan, those are almost eight points. So if we give those to Joe Biden, that's not enough for Biden to win. So the president has room. It starts with Texas. If he loses Texas, he's got major problems. Then he's got to keep the Republican strongholds, Iowa, uh, Arizona, Georgia, even North Carolina. The president's probably got to win Ohio and in fact, He's probably got to sweep it all. If he can't win Pennsylvania, say Pennsylvania goes to Biden, he's got to take back both of these to get in the head. So again, there is room for President Trump for sure, but has he done enough? We'll start to see that tomorrow. Uh, well, Wendy, Maria, I think the thing that really stood out was the administration of that controversial sedative that the state uses, midazolam. That's the first drug that goes in. Taking you back to the start of this, everything gets started at around 4 o'clock. I was one of 11 total witnesses in there, including five media witnesses. And even before they raised the curtain, John Grant could be heard yelling, let's go, let's go. He clearly wanted to push ahead with this and go on. Uh, a DOC official be then began reading the order of execution and at that point, it was just an outburst from John Grant, a string of profanities before they cut off his mic and proceeded with that procedure. That's when the midazolam was administered shortly after four o'clock and almost immediately pretty violent convulsions out of John Grant, um, vomiting, extensive vomiting. And this carried on for about 15 minutes uh, until about 415 when Grant was finally uh, uh, deemed unconscious by medical officials. Again, those officials in and out of that room trying to clean that off. It, it was it was a disturbing sight, quite frankly. Uh, about 416 then a minute after he's deemed unconscious, they proceed with the second uh, drugs, the paralytic and then the potassium chloride uh, that stops the heartbeat at 420. A doctor then again entered the room uh, to check on Grant. They did a pulse check. They checked his eyes and at 421 Scott Crow, the director of the Oklahoma Department of Corrections, declared John Grant dead. Dana, turn the focus now onto Grant's victim, Gay Carter. Any members of that family present today, and how are they reacting? Yeah, well, we weren't sure if members of the family were actually present. They would have been in a separate room behind us. There was a two-way mirror there, so we could not see if any of the family members were there. However, we did get a statement uh, from Gay Carter's daughter, Gay Carter, the victim of John Grant in 1998. Pamela Gay Carter released a statement saying, quote, at least now we are starting to get justice for our loved ones. The death penalty is about protecting any potential future victims. Even after Grant was removed from society, he committed an act of violence that took an innocent life. I pray that justice prevails for other victims' loved ones. My heart and prayers goes out to all of you. Stay strong.